Okay, well, thank you for joining me. And joining me all the way from Wellington is Rod Drury. Rod, it is awesome to connect. I think uh, last time we connected was three years ago, but thank you so much for making time on what is probably uh, another busy day in, in zero land for you. Isn't it amazing, though, how global the world is? So you see, you know, I feel like I'm following you all the time because you're on Twitter and you're seeing the you know, people we know that, um, you know, just that small amount of contact and you build a relationship with someone. And in our community, there's hundreds of people where you feel like you're really following their story and their success. Um, and it's all happening all over the world. It's fascinating. Oh, it absolutely is. Um, I, normally, when I, when I do interviews, I, I, I actually play a little track uh, beforehand, which is a track from Seal. I know you're into music, and it's actually called Amazing. And so I'm, I'm with you. I, I, I just find it absolutely amazing. But thank goodness we can do that because, I mean, part of that uh, connectivity is uh, obviously a key part of uh, what you're doing in Zero. What I want to do just quickly, I know we're going to have a look at, you know, where that's all going, but for me, one of the most interesting times that I, that I took with you was, I think it was about three years ago, we had a quick cup of coffee, you, me, and Hamish. And to my absolute surprise, you knocked me off my chair. You said, hey, Paul, why don't we start with me telling you why the heck we do what we do? And what you didn't know at the time is that that's exactly how I, I work with, uh, you know, accountants and SMEs right around the world, by getting them to define that. And I remember you said at the time, which rocked me back, you said, you know, for us, it's all about better roads and hospitals. Tell me, tell me more about that because I, I know that still drives you, but I'm not sure whether many of the people joining us would, would understand that. Yeah, no, absolutely. So we, th we do think about better schools and hospitals because um, you know, that's the most purposeful thing. And, and, in, and in any country you're in, uh, you know, I think that's a very noble purpose. And I think a lot of businesses now um, you know, do have true purpose. I think... You know, we've learned the lessons of kind of the 1% and all those sort of uh, social things that have come through. Everyone's concerned about equality. We know about the big social issues around youth employment. And I think um, two things. One is being a serial entrepreneur and done a few things. Eventually, you go from looking after yourself and your family to actually wanting to do something of good. So I think being a serial entrepreneur, that's a natural progression you see. But also, I think... Um, and, and, and purpose is obviously very important. But then um, for these type of truly global companies, and we're about 1,500 people now, you do get a, a full mixture of people that all have purpose. And the drivers of staff isn't just as simple as what it was 10 years ago. People actually have a lot of choice. They want to do something which is very purposeful. So I think all of those things um, really add up to these uh, purpose-driven businesses and what a force of good they can be. So an example that really brought that home for me was um, when I spoke at the B20 conference, which goes around the G20 Sydney a few years ago, and I managed to blag my way in to be the uh, sort of rep on that. And before the conference, there was a entrepreneurs, uh, young entrepreneurs conference, and their number one issue was youth employment. And I was thinking, well, we have internships, we have grad programs, but actually there's not enough zero companies to move the needle. So as a company, we sat back and we said, okay, we're hearing youth employment is a big issue. How do we deal with it? And what we realized, it's now operating throughout, you know, cl close to a million customers. If we can get small businesses adding half a job, that's really interesting and you can move the needle at scale. And that really crystallized us thinking. So what we did was we went and talked to um, some experts around youth employment and we did some of the heavy lifting. We wrote some business guides to say, this is what minimum wage is, what living wage is, how you use probation periods, where do you find young people, how do you manage young people. One of the things we haven't done yet, which we'll do soon, is actually put a calculator in for all of our customers so they can see what their business numbers would look like with adding one new job. Oh, so we're... We're That's fascinated powerful. to see if we can actually drive an action and move the needle at scale on some of these big social issues. That is, uh, gosh, I, 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 can, I can hardly wait to see that. That's, uh, that's awesome. And was that, Rob, when you, when you sat around that sort of proverbial kitchen table in 2008 or whenever that was, was, was that clear for you now? Or is it because we're becoming more connected that you're seeing more of that? Um, so, so, yes, we are seeing more of that. But when we sat around the kitchen table... It was uh, a few factors were there. Most of the ideas that I've seen have been when 
you've when I've seen problems in my own business. So I love running businesses, but doing the books for most people is a pain. And there hadn't been a bunch of innovation in the space, logically, because it was a very hard model to serve the fragmented small business industry. And as a technologist, you sort of see how things are changing. And it was obvious that um, the cloud fundamentally changed the distribution cost of small business. And what was really exciting is I thought it was a once in a lifetime opportunity to, as data moved from individual PCs onto your servers, that data and the good you could do with that data is fundamentally interesting. But also I think there's a big responsibility that came with that. And I felt an urgency for us to um, be the ones that took that, took that opportunity because I think we do the right things with it because we are very much a values driven organization. We weren't desperate to make money because we'd well, I'd sort of done that before and we could actually build something long term that was fundamentally good. And fast forward to two weeks ago, I'm walking around the UK and someone said it's so difficult for small businesses to get help. And I was thinking about that and I said, no, you're wrong. It's actually, we've actually privatized it. What Zero is, is not an app, it's more than a platform, it's now a global community mm. of people that are aligned around helping small business, and the private sector has sort of worked that out itself, and we're all doing it because it's a good thing to do, and it's so sustainable if you've got people building businesses around helping other businesses and giving them the tools to do that more cost effectively and with more scale, that creates this virtuous cycle. Yeah, that's a, it's a great way of looking at it. Actually, uh, th thinking of great ways of looking at it, I was fascinated uh, to hear your speech. I, I thought it was a brilliant speech, and so many people are still talking about it at uh, ZeroCon South. And one of the things that, uh, what was that, just September, I think it was, and uh, one of the things that rocked me is I used to talk about Fry Pacioli, right? And there you were talking about the magic of double entry bookkeeping and all of that kind of stuff. Tell, tell us some more about that. Yeah, so um, so we did a bit of work with Jane Gleason White, who did the, um, uh, uh, the Six Capitals and wrote the book on double entry. And she uh, tagged me into some articles that Doc Searles had been written. And he wrote this article around how, you know, basically double entry accounting saves the world. And I kind of hadn't... Um, Put that lens on because we were. I mean, I was at Arthur Young, Ernst and Young, uh, you know, when it merged, and I and I um, and I did accounting at school, Napier Boys High, and I loved the magic of double entry accounting. It was almost like what I imagined Freemasonry would be, <laughs> this, uh, <laughs> magic uh, or this um, kind of rule thing that's behind. And um, Doc Sills' article, which I'll send you the link so you can post it with the story, um, really talked about how double entry accounting is this thing that can solve a whole lot of problems. And what he said was a lot of the, and he was sort of forlorn that the, um, the big products of the time, the last 10 years, weren't real double entry mm. accounting things. And that, and that was like, what? What do you think? Because I would never think of building an accounting system that wasn't double entry accounting because the symmetry of it is just beautiful. And, and what I, there's some, like, We've we've sold we've been working on zero for a long time, and um, you know we've had multi-year strategies. And what that did was just really crystallise right from the foundations of double entry accounting some of the big problems that we've been solving, like you know multi-currency, um, how to uh, get get accountants to write a report once that can be um, write, write templates that go right across their base. We've we've actually solved some of the big um, accounting issues and we wanted to um, go back and tick all those boxes because if we build that credibility then people take seriously what we think is the next part of the journey which is the inevitable move towards AI and machine learning and also demonstrate that that some people may be scared about that or and a lot excited about it but we will do it in a way that respects the industry creates opportunities for the industry and take the industry on a journey. And we're really excited about the possibilities of it because it gets us to solve the next problem, which is the dilemma or conflict that we ask small businesses to do accounting where they're not really trained to do accounting. Yeah. 
and 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 but we can sort of give them almost no accounting and they can do their work and then the accounting professionals the bookkeepers and the accountants massive tools to actually very efficiently make sure the accounting is correct and actually small businesses don't even they need to know about that side and i think that was the magic of the journey picking up the history and respect of double entry we're solving these problems and these are the next ones we're solving and what a fun opportunity to be able to solve these problems. Oh, it's, it's inspiring, Rod, as always, to hear you talk about that because I was actually going to ask you about AI and, you know, one of the things that uh, you were dropped was this whole thing about what I'm calling NCA or no-code accounting. And, and you're quite right when you say that there are people who go, oh, God, that's scary. And, and there are others. In fact, some bookkeepers I was talking to uh, a couple of weeks ago in, uh, in, in Sydney the majority of them said, you know, when, when, when I referenced that whole thing, said, bring it on, you know. So what is it? Well, first of all, let's talk about that no code thing. And then why is it do you think there are these paradoxes between some people going, wow, that's the greatest thing since sliced bread. And on the other thing, on the other hand, people are going, oh, that's, that's a bit scary. Well, I mean, the day we're shooting this, the US election is uh, taking yeah. place. So we can see there's... Um, uh, you know, there's some people in the world, a percentage, that are probably biased towards fear and uncertainty, and some people are probably maybe more glass half full. So I think we're seeing so there's some human nature there, and we need to be respectful of um, that people just think differently about things. So it's, it's completely right that some people will be enthusiastic and get it. For others, we've got to um, demystify it and give them confidence and build trust that will do the right thing for them. So... Um, why AI and machine learning is really interesting and how do we know it's interesting? Because if you look at the Google keynotes and all those sort of things, the top technology companies in the world, their keynotes are all about this stuff yep. and they're trying to model the world. What's interesting about accounting is it's a relatively tight domain. It's a very mathematically um, sort of absolute and precise domain and we have massive data. So we processed a trillion dollars worth of transactions last year. So the it's amazing. Inside it's amazing. Yeah, oh, it's, it's crazy. And that's more than GDP because GDP is value-add, not all of the transactions summed up. So the amount of data you have is, is huge. So if you have massive data sets and a really tight domain, you get a, a really good hit. So one of the um, scenarios is, you know, one of our transformational first features of Zero was getting your bank transactions automatically into the accounting software so you effectively move bank reconciliation from something you do once every couple of months just to check things are right to being your primary data entry, which has the benefits of you're up to date every day and you've kind of done the work, a little bit of work every morning. What, we're, what we've looked at is that nine out of 10 transactions, we can automatically code because we see the wisdom of the crowd. And if it's wrong, it's very easy for accountants to fix it and bookkeepers to fix it. And that fixing it actually gives us more data, which means we won't make the mistake next time. So the, um, the R&D we've done shows we get a massive, massive hit. And what we're also doing is now we've made the transition to AWS and essentially have, um, essentially have infinite computing resources. We're moving accounting from an operator puts data in and you get information out to these automated streams of data that are coming in and then you process the stream. So when a large bank sends, you know, uh, bank records for hundred thousands of their customers into zero first thing in the morning at five in the morning We get that data. We de-dupe it We do a whole lot of value-added stuff and then load it and try to do as much of the transaction work So the business owner or the bookkeeper gets a ping on their mobile saying hey, you know um, Here's what you need to do next. That's a relatively easy thing to do with technology and It's so exciting to be able to do mm. that so so, so we, we are very confident, or we know, that AI and machine learning, uh, the, the, the small business accounting problem will uh, be, be dramatically affected by it, we think, in a very positive way. So what we've got to do is to, what we're doing is effectively using computers to do things that they're really, really good at. What that does mean is that the that just compliance activity of just putting data there, we're, we're making that much more efficient, which frees up time for accountants and bookkeepers to be growth consultants to deal with these big social issues. If, uh, if someone can get paid faster, if they can uh, do the modeling that they can afford a new truck to do another route or another container of raw materials, that directly creates jobs or gives time back for lifestyle. 
Yeah, no, I, I get it. I get it. I get it perfectly. It's interesting too when you talk about bookkeepers and accountants. I had a bit of a. Uh, I'm referring to it as a change of life, you know, uh, recently because I was, uh, uh, you know, I've, I've been spending a lot of my time, I think, since 1992 in the account, you know, predominantly with accountants, and then I had this session just with bookkeepers. It was like, oh my god, you guys are switched on, <laughs> because you know, I'd had that common thing that goes on where you know it's like accountants here and bookkeepers here. But what I'm seeing is, and I love that thing that you just said about growth consultants. And what I'm seeing is, and you might want to make a comment on it, that bookkeepers are perhaps more naturally used to connecting with their clients more frequently than, for example, the accountants. We have to encourage uh, the accountants to do that much more so than bookkeepers. Any observations, comments on that? Well, I'm sure there's nobody listening, so I'll just tell you a quick secret. <laughs> <laughs> the bookkeepers that do the work, they're, they're the ones that are in sweating every transaction to make sure it's right. And the accounting industry kind of takes the summary data and if things are wrong, it's a pain. And then they do their accounting magic. So it's really interesting. And in, in somewhere like Australia, which Australia is really great at franchises and creating models, the bookkeeping community has gone nuts and it's well organized. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, it's got Matthew at the ICB, who's been, you know, he's an icon in the industry, who's been really driving that and all over this AI thing, really positive and proactive. And uh, the Mel Lee doing her little bit there as well, yeah? Yeah, yeah, no, Mel's doing a great job on our team. But the, the um, Australian bookkeeping industry is a really defined tier and a very well-respected tier. And we're, what we're trying to do is take some of the lessons that have learned there, because I think bookkeeping is a very noble profession because you actually are in there helping small businesses and usually it's fairly cost effective and what we're doing is helping the bookkeepers scale so they can help many many yeah. uh, more businesses we also think there's a great opportunity for them to vertically integrate with accounting partners because yeah. the account is a clean set of books um, that they can work with um, but i think bookkeeping is a super exciting um, thing because it is moving from you know just doing the numbers because we can help with that to really checking and making sure it's right and the accounting treatment is right. And if they don't quite understand the accounting rules, uh, they can phone up the accountant um, and try to get it right and work with them. So we love seeing an accountant and a bookkeeper in the same org and passing the ball between each other. Yeah. Um, but what we're also seeing is that online accounting was only ever a temporary product category, and now it's breaking out of the back office to be um, to be just the business platform. Mm. So it's not just zero; it's zero plus the five hundred, the many more uh, add-ons that provide business solutions. So there's almost infinite opportunities for growth for accountants and bookkeepers as they move away from just the numbers to a foundation of numbers and then process improvement by connecting the, the whole lot of other non-financial workflows, you know, back to the numbers, which goes out to pay tax in the end. Yeah, no, that's a great, and I, lo I love that, that sort about growth consultants too. It, it's, a, it's a step up from, you know, the whole sort of old trusted advisor thing. I love that, you know, that's a yeah. great. Uh, but we, we have to respect that some people don't want oh, to grow. Of course. No, of course. But man, you can give them back lifestyle. So, you know, so uh, I think it fits you know, people that do actually want to grow and create jobs, and we love them because that's how we make the world better, but also respecting some people just want to cruise and, and go from working 45 hours a week to 35 hours a week. That's a massive, uh, massive opportunity which technology gives you as well. Exactly. In fact, that, that leads me to, uh, uh, and by the way, thanks so much for taking so much time, but one of the things I'm fascinated by, and to some extent we've talked about it, but... Um, what, what are you, uh, you know, most excited about? Uh, let me, in fact, let me ask a double question. Okay, so what are you most excited about as you, as we together look towards 2017 and beyond? And what would you say uh, within Zero, for example, or within your job as it is, as the biggest challenge right now? Um, so what I'm most excited about is we we are at the end of the beginning. So phase one of the cloud was taking the mandatory features of desktop software, the known uh, processes of you know invoices and credit notes and purchase orders coming in and doing compliance um, uh, returns and, and 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 filing. So I think all of the vendors are largely through that, and um, and now we do move from the back office to the front office. So what we'll see now is just a. Um, I think we'll see more innovation over the next couple of years than we've seen in the last yeah, ten. Yeah, sure. 
we knew what we had to do. It was like, you know, how far through are you on that? We've still got a few things to do and we've got to always make things better, but we're largely through those experiences. Yep. What we're focused on now, we had a couple of years of doing our AWS migration. And the reason we had to do that is... That I was hoping you'd talk about that because, you know, when we talk about Amazon Web Servers and everything else, there may be some people who that's like a dark magic. Um, yeah. No, so, so tell us why that was important to you. Yeah, so, so when we started, we were fortunate enough that we didn't have to go and buy a whole lot of servers and put them in our own server room. We would go, um, we went to a, a great company called Rackspace. Who's been yeah, a good partner. Uh, Rackspace, yeah. yeah. And effectively, we pay a certain amount of money per server per month and they manage those. And, you know, about every month we had another 10 servers or something like that. And, uh, and that's worked really well. Oh, what happened over the last... Uh, also, over that time, is Amazon, Google, and Microsoft have all been investing this arms race around creating these you know, infinite server farms and virtual machines that live everywhere. As well as putting that infrastructure in place, they've been bringing all the, all the new big data analytics technologies, all of the big enterprise technologies into their data centers. So if we were still sitting on rack space and we wanted to play with AI and machine learning, we'd have to say, okay, well, let's find which programming language, how many servers do we need? Might take six months to get those servers on board, then we find something new out. Whereas with Amazon, we just basically load all our stuff into the Amazon cloud and we can just configure a web page and get access to all of these new tools over that trillion dollars of data we processed last year. So what we're doing is taking all of the really big data technology that's available traditionally to large enterprises and using it to solve our small business problem. That's why we think the pace of innovation will change so dramatically because we just turn it on. It's a web page configuration and suddenly we've got full search or, um, you know, they might have some natural language processing. You know, what Amazon's doing at the moment with its Echo device is as yeah. effectively you've got millions of people training a natural language engine which will effectively soon, hopefully, be in the data centers that we can then do natural language queries to the accounting engine with all dialects. So as you look forward then, that's part of the excitement, being able to do these new things. And uh, what was it you said? The next two years are going to see more innovation than we've seen for quite a while. I mean, we've already seen a lot, but yeah, yeah. That's, that's exciting. So where, do, where does that fit in the, you know, because CEOs and chief executives are supposed to have challenges, right? So, <laughs> so what would you say yours are looking forward? Well, the first one for any business in this climate is making sure you have enough money. So that was our first one. We saw the kind of um, the markets get a bit wobbly a few years ago, so we got plenty of capital. And then it's um, the next thing is then uh, access to talent. So our business is around hiring the best people we can, empowering them to go and do the best work of their lives. So we spend a lot of time, I spend a lot of time making sure we're always hiring the best people and growing those up. So that's the main thing is it's all in a, you know, we're 1500 people, you know, growing and scaling the business is, is obviously huge. And, you know, as you know, we went public very early. So, you know, we've kind of done a startup in the public eye right from day one. Day one all yeah. as you go through. And so that's, that's quite hard work, but it's sort of turning. People are seeing that we you know, can see the numbers and they're outstanding. So um, it's actually much more, f I'd even say it's more fun now as we get close to break even. Because you, you've, you've done the hard yards, you could say. Yeah. Yeah. If someone had said, um, hey, Rod, you're going to spend 10 years of your life as the CEO of a loss-making public company. I don't know if I would have said that. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, Rod, you're, you're so good to spend time with. I tell you what, let me just try this. There's a, whenever you know, I get to meet with, with guys like you, it's always fun. And thank you again for making it fun. But I'm always aware that when you finish, you, know, you go, oh, there's one question that I probably should have asked him. So what's the one question that you would have loved me to have asked you in our time together today? Oh, and that's a very good last question. Um, uh well, one thing I'd say, one of the things I've learned, so, so I turned 50 this year, so I've been doing this for 10 years, and people say, well, how come you don't seem so stressed? Um, even, <laughs> though even though your hairline's uh, slowly um, uh, joining at the back of your feet. And I think um, a big thing for people that, that, are, that are really busy is, I think there's two kind of things I've learned. One is your brain needs time for unconscious thought. So you've just got to kind of um, give it time to process and do things. And if you get stressed, that must be a, a chemical reaction. Therefore, flushing your body and, and going doing some exercise 
um, you know, means you just can't physically feel the same. So I, so I live at the bottom of a big hill and I've ridden up that almost 600 times. Whenever I come down the hill after my ride, all my problems are solved. My brain's had time to work it out. And um, so I think uh, even when you're really, really busy, you just got to make sure you kind of get a sweat on, you know, four or five days a week. Give, that gives your brain time to think and just flushes all of, all of your chemicals. And then, you know, then it just, just, just gives you some real perspective. So I think uh, I'm very conscious of, you know, how do you manage stress? And I think um, you know, getting that lifestyle, making sure you've got plenty of quality time for your kids and your family is, is probably the key thing. And it's not work-life balance. It's really integrating. You know, these sort of 24-7 businesses like ours, it's making sure you carve off your own time, keep yourself fit, and uh, it's much better. And New Zealand, of course, is a great place to do that. And we're hiring. You can move to New Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> Rodri, awesome to hang out with you as always and thank you so much for taking time uh, let me wish you as we come to the end of this year a fantastic end of the year and uh, a great one moving forward looking forward to doing that with you as well thanks Paul pleasure bye 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 <laughs> <laughs>